Okay, I'll start. Thank you so much for the introduction. And I wanted to thank <coughs> Dr. Shah and the team for uh, inviting me uh, to this wonderful meeting. And as you heard in the morning, this conference is probably only a small part of what uh, uh, Binet and Tara are doing at an international level. I really congratulate them. So my topic is uh, lymphoma, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma specifically, and uh, I have been asked to talk about how I treat diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And I changed the topic to how I treat high-risk diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So my first few slides will talk about diffuse large B-cell lymphoma in general, and I will tell you what is considered standard of care. And then I will focus on the high-risk group which is the most challenging group of uh, uh, B-cell lymphoma. <coughs> so these are my disclosures. Uh, uh, I am with ABV. I actually was a, a member of one of their uh, data safety monitoring committee for one of the drugs that got approved recently. That's the only reason I am there. So if you look at the SEER data from 2016, about uh, 71,000 patients with a new diagnosis of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma <coughs> uh, are expected in 2016. In fact, uh, based on the UK data, diffuse lab B cell lymphoma is the commonest uh, hematologic malignancy. And overall, about 70% uh, of the patients are alive at five years. <coughs> If you look at the different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, diffuse lab B cell lymphoma is the most common subtype, and that's the topic for today. This slide kind of summarizes what is considered standard of care in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. That is, if you have a patient who has a localized disease, as you see here, standard of care would be RCHAP chemotherapy, three cycles, followed by local radiation. As you know, the ECOG trial that was published long time back in Eng New England Journal of Medicine by Tom Miller showed that uh, abbreviated course of CHOP followed by radiation is basically equal to six cycles of CHOP. And subsequent studies showed that combination with rotoxin has the same kind of uh, data with abbreviated chemoimmunotherapy. So that remains standard of care for large cell lymphoma. Now, if you look at the advanced stage, RCHOP chemotherapy, six to eight cycles remain standard of care. In the US, most of us use six. And in the case of a relapsed diffuse lab cell lymphoma, they are still curable. More than half the patients we can cure with a autologous stem cell transplant. <coughs> CHOP was established as standard of care based on the national high priority lymphoma trial. We all know that. And subsequently, it was shown that addition of rituximab to CHOP improves overall survival. And therefore, RCHOP became standard of care. But if you look at the progression-free survival of uh, data on RCHOP, you can see about 40 to 50 percent of patients do not have long-term remission. So the focus of the remaining part of my talk would be Number one, who are these patients? How do we identify them? What are the tools we have to identify these patients? And what are the strategies that have been tried to improve the outcome of these patients and what are promising for the future? So those are the questions I will be trying to answer in the remaining part of my talk. So if we define high-risk lymphoma as those patients who did not respond to standard of care or those patients who had disease came back after standard of care therapy in the beginning. We can identify one based on clinical or laboratory features. We all use International Prognostic Index or IPI. Second, we can try to identify the cell of origin, germinal center versus non-germinal center. So certainly this is one way to identify those patients. Also, we can identify the subgroup of double hit lymphomas or triple hit lymphomas or even double expressors, and I will define these in my subsequent slides. Okay, so let's look at the IPI. 
I think everyone knows this, that is, if you <coughs> have these five factors, we can put patients into one of these categories, low, low intermediate, high intermediate, and high risk, and you can see that there is a very good differentiation between these groups in terms of their outcome. And uh, subsequently, there has been a revised IPI in the era of rituximab, which also gives you the same kind of discrimination between these patient groups in a much simpler way, that is, into very good, good, and poor groups. So in either way you look, you can certainly tell the patient is sitting in front of you with a new diagnosis, his or her possibility of uh, living five years with uh, without disease. So that is a very good tool. There are other tools also, I'm sure you're familiar with the NCCN um, tool, which probably looks at these numbers a little more into split into different subtypes, but uh, accurately <coughs> distinguish between the different groups. In terms of uh, GC versus non-GC, as you all know, gene profiling has helped us to distinguish subgroups of diffuse lobby cell lymphoma which are not easily identified by morphology or immunophenotyping. And as you can see here, you have the germinal center B cell type and then the non-germinal center which is either ABC or activated B cell or the type 3 which would be included as non-GC subtype. And clearly there is a difference between the outcome of germinal center versus the non-germinal center which is difficult to identify with morphology or immunophenotyping. Now gene profiling is not something easy to do overnight, so we depend on immunophenotyping to see if we can use it as a surrogate marker, and it is, it is useful. You can do immunophenotyping and try to put the patients into one of these categories. Various algorithms are used, as you can see here, there are many different algorithms used, but the commonest subtype of the, the algorithm that is used is the hands, where we use CD10 and the MUM1 <coughs> to distinguish between GCB and non-GCB. So certainly this is one way to identify the subset of patients who are bad actors. <laughs> so at this point, I pres I'll present a case which is kind of the situation we very often see in our clinic. And based on, the clinic, based on this scenario, I can discuss the possible options for a treat treatment of patients with a patient with a high, high risk di di diffuse lab B cell lymphoma. So this is a 61-year-old female school teacher. She has diffuse lab B cell lymphoma diagnosis, GC subtype, stage 4B. LDH is more than twice upper limit of normal and a performance status of 2. So she has an IPI which is grouped as high risk because it is stage, advanced stage, LDH is high as well as performance status is low. She is CMIC negative by FISH <coughs> and she was started appropriately on RCHOP. And PET scan was negative after four cycles, so she achieved a PET negative stage after four cycles and subsequently completed two more cycles of RCHOP and achieved complete remission. So the question here is what is the next step? So I was asked to bring two questions. So this is one of the questions and uh, you should be able to use your audience response system to answer the question. So appropriate next step in the management of this patient would be one, observation, see the patient periodically in the clinic, and two, maintenance of toxmab, three, consolidation with an autologous stem cell transplant, and four, consolidation with radioimmunotherapy. You can push the answers in your ARS. Can we see the answers? Maybe I'll carry on. I think this is the first time you're using ARS here, so I'll continue. Maybe I can come back to the answer at the end. 
So just to look back at the patient, if you look at the, if you look at the IPI, she is above 61, PS was 2, LDH was high, and she was advanced stage. So she has at least four factors which clearly puts the patient into a high risk group. <coughs> And what are the strategies that have been tried in this group of patients? So let's look up some of them that has already been done. One, you can add more drugs. Instead of CHOP, you can use CHOP, adding it top aside. ACVBP has been clearly shown to be highly active and causes responses more than CHOP. Also, instead of intensification, you can make it dose dense. Instead of three weeks, you can give R-CHOP every two weeks, which is called dose-dense therapy. Uh, R-CHOP 14 has been tried in several trials, but has not panned out to be standard of care. Maintenance therapy. We know that maintenance therapy is useful in certain situations. Follicular lymphoma, there is data. Mantle cell lymphoma after chemoimmunotherapy, maintenance rituximab does help. But in diffuse RB cell lymphoma, we don't have any data to show that maintenance rituximab improves outcome after initial use of rituximab. I think the best data we have is the ECOG 4494 data, which clearly showed that if the patient received RCHOP up front, they do not benefit from additional rituximab. So that's not an option. How about consolidation with radioimmunotherapy? Many people have done that, including our group in Chicago. Memorial has done that, and from Europe too. Clearly, radioimmunotherapy consolidation improves the outcome. It improves the uh, uh, complete remission rate and progression-free rate, but there is nothing to indicate improvement in overall survival. How about consolidation with stem cell transplant? There is some data, and I will show you that in the subsequent few slides. And finally, incorporating new agents. So those are the two options I will discuss a little more in detail. <laughs> now, dose-dense therapy, as I mentioned, has been tried in the past a lot, but I just want to show you an example saying that it is still being looked at. Even in the last ASH meeting, we heard about a trial where the Germans have included higher doses of rituximab trying to see if that will improve the outcome. And clearly, there is no improvement in event-free survival or overall survey. So higher dose of chemotherapy or higher dose of rituximab has not been shown to improve long-term outcome in diffuse lab B cell lymphoma. The next question is, is there a role of stem cell transplantation in high-risk diffuse lab B cell lymphoma patients who are responding to frontline chemotherapy? There has been several trials over the past several years. As you can see, some of the trials I have summarized here, there has been negative trials, clearly at least nine, and there are several positive trials. One of them, the three of them I looked at, one is positive for event-free survival, not overall survival. The second one is positive in retrospective subset analysis, and the third thing is a prospective study, and that's the one I will talk about here also, it's a subset analysis, not a planned analysis. So that's the SWOG 9704. This was published by Dr. <coughs> Patrick Stiff in New England Journal of Medicine about three years back. So patients with diffuse lab cell lymphoma, high intermediate and high IPI, they were treated with CHOP. <coughs> and then patients who had less than PR went on to receive second line chemo and an autologous stem cell transplant. So that's one group. The other group, at least complete or partial response, and they completed the chemo and went on to autologous transplant. And the other group received three more cycles of chemo, so they received a total of eight cycles of CHOP. And then patients were uh, taken to transplant only at relapse. And what was the outcome? Well, about 400 patients were randomized, about 125 and 128 in each of the arm, the control and the experimental arm. And if you look at the uh, data from all patients, this is all the patients who have been eligible. And clearly there is an improvement in the overall, sorry, in, in the progression-free survival. But when it comes to overall survival, there was no difference. So that's the data the whole group that was eligible for the trial. Now, if you look into the subsets, so this is 
a subset. If you look at the left side, this is the high intermediate risk group. Because remember, this trial had high intermediate and high risk IPI. So the high intermediate, again, the progression fee survival, no difference, and overall survival, no difference. Whereas if you look at just the high IPI group, there is a significant difference between the patients who got transplant up front and the patients who did not get it up front in terms of event-free survival, progression-free survival, as well as overall survival. So clearly, this subset of patients benefited from an upfront transplant. So the conclusion from the authors was that yes, autologous transplant, if it is done early in this subset of patients, it improves the <coughs> progression fee survival in this subset of high-risk patients. And the overall survival after stem cell transplant was not improved, probably because of the effectiveness of style-based transplantation. So can we take this data and say, okay, every high-risk patient should be transplanted up front? Well, there are some issues with the study. That is, number one, I mentioned this was a subset analysis. This study was not powered for that. This was not a planned analysis. And secondly, not all patients received rituximab. And thirdly, of course, this was not a pet director study. So if you look at the other patient, the patient I presented, I don't think this data would be applicable to her, primarily because the patient received rituximab throughout the initial treatment, and also the patient achieved complete remission by PET at four cycles, after four cycles. So we don't know if a patient who received rituxan up front and achieved PET negative CR after four cycles, who has completed six cycles of treatment, will benefit from autologous transplant in addition to the beneficiality achieved. So that's why we can't apply that data as such. <coughs> so to summarize, consolidation and maintenance in this disease group is still a work in progress. I am not giving up. I think there's still a possibility that we may identify a subset of patients who will benefit from an autologous stem cell transplant. So since that's a work in progress, let's try to see what are the other things that we can uh, do in these patients. Well, how about frontline strategies incorporating novel agents? If you look at the pattern of relapse, whether it is RCHAP 21 or 14, you can see that most of the relapses are happening in the first two years after completing treatment, which means this is where we should focus our attention. In other words, strategies aimed at maintenance or after this period is not really going to help with us. So no new agents who are going to be combined should be tried either during treatment or immediately after completion of treatment within the next six months <coughs> based on this data. So that's the statement that is made here. If, if you want to make a progress beyond our chop, we should do something early. And they need to be either at the start of therapy or during therapy or within the first few months of uh, completion of treatment. So let's look at some of the novel agents that has been uh, tried in this situation. One is combining no new agents with RCHOP. And one of the agent, of course, is uh, the B cell receptor targeting agent, ibrutinib. As you know, this drug has, been has an established role in B cell malignancies with approval in more than one B cell malignancy already. And it's a BTK inhibitor, which specifically blocks the BTK pathway, which is very important in most B cell malignancies. And some of the early data, as you see here, showed that the non-GCB patients responds very well when ibrutinib is combined with RCHOP. As you can see here, 91% of the patients are in complete remission when RCHOP is combined with the ibrutinib. And other agents like brentuximab, CD30 directed uh, treatment, also brings out responses. As you can see, majority of the patients had excellent responses. And uh, the white bars actually refers, represents diffuse lab B cell lymphoma. And about 25 to 30 percent of patients with diffuse lab B cell lymphoma do express CD30. And we also know from the heart skins data from uh, WashU very well that even so called CD30 negative patients can respond very well and even go into complete remission in some cases. So, this is certainly an attractive 
option. And based on the data on this relapse patients, there was data published or presented in the last uh, ASH meeting from the same group looking at the combination in patients with uh, the same high-risk group in the upfront setting. And they were patients with IPA of three to five, and they achieved high rate of complete remissions. And CD30 positive patients understandably had much better response than CD30 negative. And the poor prognostic subsets, because CD30 imparts a poor prognosis in diffuse lab B cell. So the poor prognosis sub subsets like CD30 positive, ABC subtype as well as EB positive, actually they had favorable outcome with this combination. So this is another option for the future. So with that, I'm come to the last topic, that is how about this group of patients with the double hit and triple hit lymphoma, as well as double expressors. So by definition, diffuse raw B cell lymphoma or a high grade B cell lymphoma that is unclassified according to the old WHO, which is intermediate between diffuse raw B cell lymphoma burkits, if these patients have MIC gene rearrangement along with BCL2 or BCL6 gene rearrangement by FISH or cytogenetics, then they are called double hit lymphomas. In contrast, double expressors means they have expression of the protein, that is by immunohistochemistry, they are MIC positive along with BCL2 or BCL6. Doesn't necessarily mean there is gene rearrangement present. So that is double expressors or DEL. Now both these groups, double hit as well as double expressors have an outcome that is inferior to <coughs> patients who don't have this gene rearrangement or expression. And almost all the double hit lymphomas are GC subtype. They are aggressive in terms of biologic behavior and uh, there has been multiple studies showing inferior outcome. And uh, even with stem cell transplant, their outcome has not been shown to be very favorable. And if you look at multivariate analysis that included the usual things we look at, IPI and cell of origin, this stands as a very strong in, uh, negative predictive factor. And the biological effect of MIC translocation depends on the partner. What's the type of translocation partner? And what's the type of double hit partner, BCL2 versus BCL6, the cell of origin, as well as the protein expression. So all these are factors which can influence the biological behavior of these patients. Now, what do we know about the response and outcome in these patients? Unfortunately, we only have retrospective data. There is a lot of prospective trials going on, but this is one of the best data we have. This actually is from the Chicago group, a consortium of several institutions. Uh, what it shows is, if you look at the various chemotherapy that has been used, it is clear that patients who received RCHOP has much inferior outcome compared to patients who had a more intensive regimen. And if you look at the different types of intensive regimen, it looks like hyper-CVAD has much higher response rate compared to RCHOP and other regimens. And as you know, hyper-CVAD is not a um, regimen that most patients in the older age group can tolerate, so that's very important to consider this too. But at least based on this, which is one of the largest uh, retrospective data group we have, it is um, fair to say that RCHOP is not enough if you have a patient with double hit lymphoma. Data on transplant is also very sparse. This is one of the few data we have on patients who benefit from stem cell transplant patients with double hit lymphoma. As you can see here, there is some benefit in an auto autologous stem cell transplant. Patients who achieve complete remission, they certainly behave better, just like you know the data from other lymphomas. There are prospective trials going on, including some of the data from uh, NIH, from <clears throat> Dr. Dan Levy and his group, and Wyndham Wilson using EPOC, and that regimen has been shown in MIC positive patients to give durable progression-free survival as well as overall survival. So that certainly is a promising chemotherapy regimen for the future. There are other agents that have been tried in this group. Lenalidomide, as you know, has uh, many immunomodulatory activities and uh, it has activity through the IRF4 as well as the NF-kappa B pathways. 
and the preliminary data on um, lenalidomide as a single agent shows that the activity is much more in the non-GCB group compared to the GC group. So that is something, especially because of the NF-kappa B pathway, which is very active in the non-GCB. And that led to the so-called R-square chop or R2 chop, some people call, and which clearly shows that the big difference in the outcome between the GC and the non-GC, this is a GC and this is a non-GC with r chop alone, has gone away by using or adding lenalidomide to r chop So clearly, there is significant activity in combination when you use it for the appropriate subgroup of patients. Other strategies other than the r 2 chop would be combination with ibrutinib, bortezumib is the the data from pyramid trial John Leonard presented, which is actually being reviewed as a manuscript now, in terms of efficacy and outcome, it was a negative trial. There was no difference between RCHOP and uh, RCHOP with bortezomib, but it taught us a lot of um, lessons about clinical trials using biological agents, positioning and uh, dosing, etc. So that's why the data is still very attractive although it's a negative outcome. There are several agents being tried along with RCHOP, including the PD-1 inhibitors, and a trial just started combining RCHOP with uh, blinatumumab. As you know, blinatumumab is the CD19-directed monoclonal antibody. It's the bite, the bispecific antibody, which uh, engages the T cells also, which is now FDA-approved for relapsed ALL, and that's a very attractive uh, treatment regimen. In fact, there is another study where high-risk uh, diffuse lab B-cell lymphoma patients can receive it after st autologous stem cell transplant uh, consolidation also. So that is another attractive area to look for in the future in terms of data. Um, some other agents, metformin. Uh, this study is from our own group. Metformin has been shown to down-regulate MYC expression in the laboratory, and basis based on that, we have a trial combining dose-adjusted epoch or along with metformin. These are some of the agents, again, has been very clearly shown to cause higher dose responses in, uh, in the double expressors as well as in down-regulating MYC protein. So based on that information, I have a second question. I don't know if I should try it or skip it. I think this is a summary of what I just talked about, that is, <clears throat> all of the follow following are appropriate therapeutic options in double heat lymphoma, except, I don't think I mentioned, CNS prophylaxis is recommended because of the high incidence in patients with diffuse uh, in double heat lymphoma. So I mentioned the data on autologous transplant is very sparse. I think clinical trial is something we will always encourage in these patients. And based on this, I think RCHOP may be the answer because if, you, if the patient is able to receive a more intense treatment, I always try to consider that. That is the message that is being conveyed from this question. So I think that's my last slide. So what I was trying to do in the last half an hour was to give you an overview of what is considered standard of care for diffuse RB cell lymphoma. And then the second part of the talk, I tried to identify the high-risk group, whether it is by clinical parameters or by biological methods, immunohistochemistry, as well as molecular characteristics, identify the subgroup. And then I try to tell you what are the, the strategies that have been tried in the past, tried and failed, or some of them still in the work in terms of improving the outcome of this group and what seems to be prog promising. And uh, I will stop my talk here. Thank you very much for your attention.